Welcome back, everybody, to The Seven Spirits of Sodom. This is part three. And uh, I just want to say, man, I warned y'all, I told you in the introduction that we were going to be covering some troubling topics. And of course, last week we looked at generational perversion. I mean, like, oof, how uglier does it get than that? How much more wicked does it get than that? So we're tackling some really, really tough things here, and, and I understand that. It isn't easy to listen to, it isn't easy to study and research, it isn't easy to say. But friends, we've got to look at these things. We have to address them in our day and time. We can't just bury our head in the sand and pretend like it's not happening. If the church does that, we will lose our effectiveness and our influence in reaching this generation, and we can't risk it. We just can't do it. So as we're approaching these topics, it's a really good thing to say, listen to me, we've got to approach this with humility and compassion, with prayerfulness, we've got to guard our hearts. You know, you talk about generational perversion, man, it's it's easy to get angry. It's easy to hate people who are doing things that are so diabolical. It's easy to become self-righteous. Well, I would never. It's easy to kind of have a superior attitude and we condescend to people that are participating in these things. Guys, we gotta guard our heart from that. We can't do that. But also we can't be silent. We have to speak the truth, but we have to do it in love. That's the balance that the Apostle Paul gives us in the book of Ephesians. We gotta speak the truth in love. So what we're doing, man, we're trying to connect the dots between ancient scripture and today's culture. We're trying to bring biblical clarity to cultural chaos. So we're unpacking the seven spirits of Sodom, these spirits that seem to rule and reign over Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Lot. I've asked you to read Genesis chapter 18, verse 22 through chapter 19, verse 29, kind of tells the whole story of these two men. We know them later to be angels. But these two men who showed up in Sodom, where Lot was sitting at the the gate of the city, and they show up, and we know that they're coming to judge it, but Lot doesn't know. They didn't know who they are. So they show up, and in good Middle Eastern hospitality, according to their culture, he invites them in, hey, come to my house, want to cook for you, want to wash your feet, come spend the night. And they say, no, no, we're going to sleep out here in the open square, And, and Lot challenges them. Really, he forbids them from speaking or from sleeping in the open square. And uh, I'll I'll tell you why in a minute. But um, so here's this introduction, right? Here's these guys that show up and they're talking a lot and uh, they're in the place of Sodom. Now, when we jump forward to the New Testament, there's something really important that happens here. I don't want you to miss this. I shared this with you last time, but I want this to get in your heart and in your head. Jesus talks about what happened to Sodom in the days of Lot in the New Testament thousands of years later. In Luke chapter 17, verses 28 through 30, listen to the words of Jesus. He said, likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus validates what happened in Sodom, the destruction that happened, the judgment that came. Now, what was it like there? Man, it was business as usual. People were totally clueless to the depravity in their own lives. They were clueless to the coming judgment that was based on their exceeding wickedness. Now, listen to me, beloved. Jesus said the culture is gonna be just as clueless about their own sin and the coming judgment of God when he returns as they were in the days of Lot. That's why we've gotta preach the gospel. That's why we've gotta not water it down. We gotta let people know. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none of us that's perfect and holy and doesn't need to repent. Everybody needs to repent of something. Everybody needs to ask God to forgive them and for Jesus to be their savior. Like everybody needs to do that. So we've got to communicate the truth. We've got to do it in love. And it doesn't matter what the particular sin or the topic is or how much flack you're going to catch for addressing it. It just doesn't matter. All right. So again, last time we looked at the sin of generational perversion. I mean, as wicked as it gets, today we're going to discuss the spirit of intimidation. Now, it's just a known fact. We live in days of intimidation. 
People are being attacked by half-truths, total lies, and satanic slander all over the place. Now, why is this happening? What's the devil doing? It's all with the hopes of canceling your reputation, your influence, and God's truth. That's the goal. The goal is to cancel you, to silence you, to intimidate you, to get you to be someone who refuses to speak up because you're afraid of the cost. You're afraid of the wrath that will come your way. Friends, this is happening all across America. TV shows, documentaries are being done about it. It's part of our culture right now. And so whether it's the media deciding what's true and not true, deciding what, what person they want to slander or attack, whether it's social media executives doing so-called fact checks and then canceling people for saying things that they disagree with, whether it's people on social media starting campaigns against you, whatever it might be, intimidation, the spirit of intimidation is running rampant in our society just like it did in the days of Lot. I remember fairly recently I was talking to my good friend and more importantly our brother in Christ Secretary Mike Pompeo and he said these words to me. He said, Steve, it used to be the media that they would twist what you say. Now they just make things up to intimidate people. That's the day we're living in. As it was in the days of Lot, so will it be when Jesus returns. And we're seeing that same spirit of intimidation right now and it's on the increase big time. So I wanna unpack the spirit of intimidation for you, all right? Remember, Lot has the angels in his house. He doesn't let him sleep in the open square due to the sexual perversion that ruled the city and the physical threat that that perversion created for these two men and or angels, if you will. So Lot brings the angels in his house. We pick the story up, Genesis chapter 19, verse four and five. Now, before they lay down, before they go to bed, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter, they surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Think about it, friends. Would there be anything more intimidating than being surrounded and severely outnumbered by people who want to gang rape you? Notice the plural form of the word back there. Bring them out to us that we may know them. I mean, this is as wicked as it gets. This is intimidating as it gets. And yet Lot he doesn't cave right away. And just a few verses later in verse nine, you know, as Lot's kind of defending these men, what do they say to him? Stand back. What, what are they saying? The, this angry, perverted mob is telling Lot, who's standing for truth and who's trying to protect these men, these angels, what do they say? Stand back. They're telling Lot, in essence, to get out of the way of their sinful agenda and plan. Stand back. It gets even worse. Later in verse 9, they tell Lot, we are going to deal worse with you than with them. Worse, friends. It doesn't just mean worse in a physical way. It literally, in the Hebrew language, means we're going to break you. We're gonna deal worse with you than with them. We're gonna break you, Lot. Now notice, friends, the spirit of intimidation's goal is to get you out of the way of a wicked agenda and to break you. Make no mistake about it. That's, that's what drives this spirit, to silence the church, to get the church out of the way, to get anybody who's speaking the truth out of the way, and simultaneously, to break you, to destroy you, your reputation, your future, your influence, your business, whatever it is, that's the goal. It's to produce cowardice and silence and surrender for you to, you know, kind of uh, wave the white flag because intimidation comes, you see the price that people pay who speak up for truth, and then all of a sudden you go, oh no, I'm not willing to pay that price, and so you allow yourself to be intimidated, you allow yourself to be silenced, and in essence, you surrender to the enemy of our souls. 
Friends, there's no time for that. We cannot do that. I also find it interesting and even scary because I've seen this in real life. I've seen people treat me the way I'm talking about, where out of their own mouths, they know what they're doing is bad, and yet they threaten and try to intimidate Lot or you or me by being worse even than they originally intended. See, there's, there's an increase in this. This is, this is mind-boggling. They know what they're doing is bad, but they want to be worse to some people than other people. Again, wanting to break you. When people operate in a spirit of intimidation, they admit they're doing evil, but they don't care. Listen to what happens. Their conscience has become so darkened, their heart so hardened, that they will do anything to get you out of their way and break you. Whew. This is serious stuff, man. Jesus said, just like it was in the days of Lot, it's going to be when I come back. It's going to be that same way. Whew. I, don't, I don't know what that does to you. It, it should sober you. It should rattle you. You got to ask yourself this question, friend. Are you going to let people intimidate you? Will you cave to people's intimidation? Will you wave the white flag? Will you give up your Christian influence? Will you stop speaking truth in love because it's going to cost you too much that you're, you're too uncomfortable if you do that? You better put your comfort on the cross of Christ and crucify your comfort. You better be ready to stand for truth in the days that we're living in. Again, not being a jerk, not, not being intimidating yourself, but speaking the truth in love and not backing down. Beloved, the spirit of intimidation has been assaulting the people of God for centuries. This isn't just something new. We've seen it in the days of Lot as well. But what about Pharaoh? What about Pharaoh intimidating Moses with the armies of Egypt? What about Goliath intimidating David, mocking him to scorn, mocking God to scorn, intimidating by his size, intimidating by his spear and his shield and, and making himself to be big and huge and, and um, undefeatable, right? Probably not a good word, but you know what I meant. It's intimidating. Let me tell you something else about intimidation. Intimidation always wants to make your resources, which is God himself. Intimidation always wants to make your resource seem weak and to make their strength seem elevated and strong. That's why, friends, you gotta keep your eyes on God. You gotta understand who's on your side. So David said, who's Goliath to come against me, this uncircumcised Philistine? He knew that Goliath was, in fact, actually mocking God while he was intimidating the armies of Israel, and David wasn't having it. Man, we need some Davids in the world today. We really do. Our list continues. What about the Syrians? It says that the Syrians came against Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 6. What did they do? Just like in, in Lot's example, they surrounded Elisha's camp with horses and chariots. What about the Assyrians when King Sennacherib came against King Hezekiah of Israel? Total spirit of intimidation, making God and the rest of Hezekiah's resources seem weak while magnifying King Sennacherib's power and so-called authority. Intimidation galore, it goes on and on. One last example, you remember the story of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is trying to rebuild Jerusalem 400 years before Jesus comes on the scene, trying to rebuild the ruins and the enemies of God and the enemies of God's people come and constantly attacking Nehemiah with intimidation, with threats, with slander and accusation. Friends, this is an age old satanic tactic that we have to understand. There's nothing new under the sun. That's what Solomon told us. This is that. What's happening today is what has happened throughout history to the people of God. So this spirit of intimidation, it's gonna increase as we get closer to the return of Jesus. Now, you can't just hear me say that and go, oh, okay, 
No, you need to know that. And you need to prepare your own spirit to deal with that. What are you going to do when you get intimidated for taking a stand for truth, for righteousness, for the gospel, and for the Lord Jesus Christ. What are you gonna do? You need to decide in advance. You can't try to decide for the first time while you're in the blast furnace of opposition and intimidation. You won't make it. You've gotta start preparing your heart now. You've gotta be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might now. When you see that these things are, are a possibility to come your way, Man, you've got to decide now, what are you going to do? Because it's in those dark moments that you need to remember the decision that you made while you were still in the light. So here's what we need to realize as the people of God. Okay, first of all, as the people of God, we're the ones who are surrounded, but we're not surrounded by the sodomites of old. We're surrounded by by God himself. We are surrounded by the angelic host. There are far more for us than are against us. Again, our story about Elisha and um, uh, the Syrian army coming against him and in, 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 encircling him and threatening and intimidating him. Second Kings chapter six, what happens? Elisha's in there sleeping, he's in his tent. Elisha's servant comes to him and says, oh my God, like he's having a meltdown. Oh my God, oh my God, they're surrounding us and we're afraid and what are we gonna do? And Elisha is so settled in his spirit, he's so resolved in understanding that God is for him and if God is for him, who can be against him? He's so settled in that, that he just says a simple little prayer and he says, Lord, open this servant's eyes. Open his eyes and let him see. The Lord answered the prayer and the servant saw that what surrounded the army that was surrounding them was the army of the angelic host. They were surrounding, they were in charge, they were for Elisha while he was being intimidated. You need to know, friends, we're surrounded and it's not just by the mere enemy of our soul. We are surrounded by God and the angelic host themselves. Listen, friends, because I realize that, it allows me and empowers me and encourages me to take a strong stand in all kinds of places, in all kinds of situations, because God and any single servant is the majority in any conflict. I don't care how outnumbered you are in the flesh, you are more than a conqueror in the spirit. You're surrounded by God. Don't forget that. We've gotta see that, understand that. Next, we can't stand back. We can't stand down and we dare not shut up. We've gotta be dressed up with the armor of God. We've gotta stand up for Christ. We've gotta speak up the word of God, the truth, and we've gotta be filled up with the spirit of God. I'm just telling you, that's what it's gonna to take to make it through these days of intimidation and cancel culture that's around us. Don't, don't be afraid, don't fear, God is for us. Take a stand, put on the armor of God, stand up for truth, speak up for truth, be filled with God's spirit and allow that boldness and that courage to rest upon your life. That's what it takes. This isn't just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and do it in your own strength. God forbid, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by God's spirit. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Ask the Spirit of God to fill you every day before you leave your house. That's the difference maker right there. Third and finally, we gotta be determined to not be broken. Regardless of the intimidation, the attacks, the threats, you've gotta be resolved. They, whoever they are, that they will not break you. You weren't made to be broken by the enemy. You're made to be broken before the Lord, humble before him, trusting him. That's the only breaking that should be happening in and through your life is being broken before the Lord, but never to be broken by the enemy of your soul. Be determined, be resolved. Do not let the enemy break you. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever in Jesus' name. So as it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be when Jesus returns. This is that what's happening right now. 
is what's happened in times past. It's going to increase. Prepare your heart. Get ready for battle. Don't give up ground. Don't do it. So join us next time as we unpack the spirit. Are you ready for another lighthearted study? The spirit of depravity. God bless you and keep you. Seek God, understand the times, and know what you must do. God bless you. Pray for this lost and broken, dying world. Love them with the love of Christ. Don't give up ground. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. God bless you. We'll see you next time.